these past days, at least a few digits under 100 degrees. 469-256-8877 is the number we put up. If you have a prayer request or a question or a topic that you'd like to study on, or if you'd like to receive one of these study edition Bibles, we'd love to send these out. Just send us your contact information. We'll make sure that you receive one of these. I want to wish my son Aaron a happy 16th birthday. This day, 16 years ago, Aaron was born, and so happy birthday to you, Aaron, and thank you for Aaron's help recording these every Wednesday. I also want to remind us that this next Wednesday evening, September the 6th, we will resume our meal at 6 o'clock and devotional in the Family Life Center, and so let's prepare for that this next Wednesday, September the 6th. It's hard to believe we're already getting into September. The Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812 has been called the Needless Battle. That's because the war was already over by the time that it was fought. A peace treaty between the American, uh, Americans and British had been signed 15 days earlier than the war, but the news in those days traveled slowly. There was slow communication. It didn't reach the battlefield in time, and about 1,500 Soldiers were killed or wounded in that needless battle. When it comes to the hurts and the pains, the difficulties and challenges that we experience in life, the hardships, the trials, the obstacles, for the Christian, we need to remember that those hardships are never meaningless. They are never needless. In other words, God does not waste our pain and suffering. No, he uses those storms of life to shape us, to mold us. Like a muscle that's being exercised, he strengthens our faith. He gives us a greater character of endurance and perseverance. He emboldens our prayers. He uses these things in our life to to help us to minister to other people. He uses these things in life to be a message of his love, to bring us closer to him. No, God never wastes our challenges. Our struggles are never meaningless, and they are not needless. And I want to speak on that very topic today. Right now, I know, personally know, and you know, many people that are hurting, Christians that are struggling with their faith, Christians that are dealing with illnesses of all types, Christians that are dealing with stress, financial hardship, they're just going through storms of life. And I've called our lesson today, I'm Trusting in God, looking at Psalm 13, verses 1 through 6. Perhaps you find yourself going through one of these storms right now, these storms of life. And I've heard it said before that when it comes to storms of life, we are either in one, we're headed for one, or we're coming out of one. It's not a matter of if the storm is coming, it's a matter of when. Our faith will all be stretched at one point in time in our lives. We will all go through things that God uses for good in our lives, but also they're difficult. And so how do we go about living through those? Oftentimes, we don't even have a choice to avoid it. It's right in front of us, and we can't seem to swerve left or right. We have to go through it. We can't go around it. And sometimes they happen in life 
not because of anything that we've done. It's just that God has allowed that testing, that trial for a season. Well, how do we handle such storms? The scripture that we turn to today, Psalm 13, gives us an example, an example that has strengthened Christians through the ages, an example that has caused people to cling to faith and, and empower them to have a greater trust in God, even though they are being tossed in the midst of a storm. The title of this Psalm 13 tells us both the author and the audience. It begins by saying that it's a Psalm of David, but then it also says it's written to the chief musician, or that is the director of music. Perhaps this is Herman or Heman the singer, or it's Asaph, or it's a leader of the choirs or musicians in David's time. But I have a suggestion. What if we viewed the chief musician, the director of music, as God himself? This is, after all, a psalm of prayer written to God, to the chief musician. What if we viewed it as God himself, who, as our, the song of our lives go day by day and year by year, sometimes we go through notes in the songs of our lives of jubilation, of joy, notes of victory, notes of triumph, notes of hallelujah, the hallelujah chorus singing in our lives because we go through those seasons of life. But other times we go through times where the note is a little bit off. The key sounds a little bit ominous, perhaps a little bit fearful, maybe even a little bit painful. And so God as the musician, the chief musician, is able to bring beauty out of that song. The songs that, yes, times of triumph, but also times of difficulty. He, as the chief musician, is able to bring the notes all together in our life for something beautiful. This is also a psalm of transition. It starts with David in a place of deep discouragement and despair, but then David finishes in a place of tremendous trust and joy and encouragement. Do you know anyone right now who is going through deep discouragement and despair? Maybe a doctor's visit that was less than you had hoped for? Or maybe not enough money coming in to pay for these high cost of things that we're living through these days? Maybe a job that didn't turn out quite like you had hoped? Maybe a season of life that's just really difficult right now. We know people, perhaps you're going through that or any one of us. Well, David shows us how to face such trials. First of all, there is the, the step to acknowledge the pain. It says in Psalm 13, verse 1, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? This particular psalm is what is called a psalm of lament. It's not a word that we use very often, but it's a psalm that takes deep grief and deep sorrow of lament and joins it together with the re, not only the reality of the pain that I'm going through, but combines it with the reality of God's goodness, God's love, God as the chief musician who's able to bring it all together. In other words, David here is experiencing something that is deeply distressing to him. And we don't know exactly what it is, but there's an enemy that is fighting against him. Perhaps he's referring to Saul who David, as those 13 years from being anointed as king, but actually waiting to sit on the throne, is having to endure this, this persecution. Maybe you've had a persecutor in your life, someone that brought pain, someone that brought difficulty and challenges, and maybe a, a boss in the workplace that's just hard to work with. We've all experienced these things. And so this is what's called the practice of lament. Maybe that's something that we should include more often in our lives is, first of all, just acknowledging the reality of the pain, but then combining it with the goodness of God who's able to bring us through that pain. It is the practice that 
can get us through the storm. And this is, has, has carried Christians through the storms through the years. That's what David is doing right here in Psalm 13. You can hear the pain in his voice in these first two verses. How long, Lord? How long, O oh Lord? Some translations read. It seems that the reality is that, that every child of God has asked this question at one time or another in their lives when they just feel like God isn't as close when God isn't as close as, as you would like him to be. Keep in mind that our feelings don't always tell us the truth about how close we are to God. The reality is, is that God is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. It says Psalms 34. And when you're going through a season where your heart's broken, it feels like God isn't close at all. But the feelings don't always tell us the truth. In reality, God is close to the brokenhearted. And sometimes when we're on the mountain of, jubil of jubilee, of hallelujah, of everything is going great in our lives, it feels like God is near. And those tend to be the times when we're not as close. See, it's in the valley of life that we feel despair, but God says, I'm close to those who, who are walking through the valley, perhaps of the shadow of death. How long, O oh Lord? This question is repeated four times in this psalm, and you can hear the anguish of heart coming from David. When we go through times of despair and it feels like God is distant, we need to, we need to pause and realize that our emotions don't always tell us just how close God is. And we need to realize that perhaps he is closer than it feels like he is. Because our feelings sometimes aren't the best guide. Feelings sometimes and emotions that, that we have, and we can thank God that he's given them to us because we need them. The emotional aspect of our being. But it's kind of like the, the temperature outside as compared to the heat index. It feels a certain temperature, but the heat index reveals that it's the, the, the facts are it may be 100 degrees, but the heat index says it feels like 115. Or the wind chill factor, the thermometer may say 32 degrees outside. That's the facts. But how it actually feels is 15 degrees outside with the wind chill. So we need to recognize that God is close, even when it doesn't always feel that way. So lament is what he's doing here in the midst of this storm. And he's doing this by, first of all, acknowledging his pain. And when it comes to pain, we do everything we can to avoid it. And we should try to avoid it if you can. We do what we can to try to sidestep the pain. We'll try to suppress it. We will try to disavow it. We will try to drown it out with different things. We don't want any part of, of, of pain. But sometimes we go through such suffering in life such distress, difficulties, storms, and it's important for us to acknowledge the pain, to be real about it, to be honest with God. God, this is what I'm dealing with today. And name it. They say to name the pain. Name it. Name what you're going through. Name what you're feeling. Be real with God. Don't pretend. Sometimes we think we need to approach God as, as I'm strong enough to get through it. I, I'm just going to tie one shoe and tie the other and take one step forward. Sometimes we need to just humble ourselves before the Lord and acknowledge that this is difficult pain that I'm experiencing, worry that I feel, fear that I'm encountering, things that are keeping me up at night. God, this is real, and I, I, I need you to carry my burden. There are some times in life that I wake up and there are so many burdens of the day that I just say, God, I need you to carry my burden today. God, I, if you don't carry my burden, I don't think I'm going to make it to the day. Oh, what a practice that David does here. Imagine going to the doctor and saying, the doctor says, okay, tell me where it hurts so that I can help you. And you say, well, doc, I'd really not like to talk about that right now. And we hide it from the doctor. I mean, how much healing do you think that a doctor is able to provide or to help with? Not much in a case like that. It's not because they lack the resources. It's not because they lack the skill or the ability. They have all the training. It's not because they lack the power. It's because 
It, it takes two to, to heal. It takes a person being honest with the doctor and saying, this is where it hurts. This is what I'm experiencing. And then that doctor is able to bring all of their, his skill, all of her talent and resource to help bring healing in that person's life. God cannot heal what we choose to conceal. He feels forgotten, David does. He feels forsaken and forlorn, but he humbles himself before the Lord with this honest, honest complaint to God, leaving all pride on the ground. Second of all, he brings a bold request. It says, look on me and answer me, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or, or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when they see that I, when they, when I fall. As soon as David acknowledges the pain that he's experiencing, he gets bold before God. This is him coming boldly before the throne of grace. Praise the Lord that we, because of Jesus, have the ability to come boldly before the throne of God. And we don't know the exact details of Psalm 13 behind it. But one thing we do know, he is fearing for his life. There is a threat to his life. He doesn't know if he's going to make it through the night. And he's anguishing and saying, if you don't help me, Lord, I may sleep in death and my enemies will, will mock me and they will boast because of what they've done. We're told in scripture four different times that nothing is impossible with God. Why do you think that we're told that four times? I mean, once is enough for sure, but the second time, the third time, the fourth time, it's God's way in his providence of knowing that we as a forgetful people would forget that God is all-powerful and that we can depend upon him. In those times when, when, he, when we feel forgotten, David says, God, I feel forgotten, but will you see me? God, I feel forsaken, but will you help me? God, I feel forlorn, but will you open the way before me? God, it's dark and I can't see, but will you open my eyes to see? So that in any situation that we go to, go through in life, we may feel forgotten, but we say, God, see me. God, I feel forsaken, but would you help me? Would you carry me? God, I feel forlorn. But would you open the way before me? Darkness all around, but God, open my eyes to see. We are told in Scripture to have a persistent prayer life, to pray and not give up. Jesus told a parable once about a judge. And in my mind, as I read about this parable, I see a judge who owns a gated mansion in the Hamptons, a judge who has a swimming pool that's in the shape of a dollar sign, a judge that wears Armani suits, drives a 911 Porsche Carrera Coupe with a personalized license plate on the back that says, my way. I see a judge that was on the payroll of every mafia boss and drug dealer in the east, on the eastern coast. I see a judge that was kept in office by the mafia because he kept them out of jail. A judge that received votes from the mafia because he gave them a free walk. A judge who was a crook. His mother knew it. His minister knew it. His kids knew it. God knew it. The judge could care less. He never gave God a second thought or an honest person a second chance. And Jesus in this parable says that this judge was a scoundrel. And he certainly didn't care about helping a widow but Jesus said in the parable that in that same town of the judge, there was a widow who kept coming to this judge saying, give me justice. My rights are being mistreated. I'm being mistreated. Give me help. And he kept declining to hear her. He kept refusing to listen to her. He wouldn't change his mind about her. And what did this widow do? Well, he, Jesus says that she kept finding him. She found him at lunch and brought her petition before him. <coughs> she found him at the golf course. 
and brought her petition before him. She found him while he was getting into his limo and brought her request before him over and over and over again. This widow would not let him go. Finally, the judge says, anything to get rid of you, what do you want? <coughs> and Jesus says, this is how we treat prayer so that you pray without giving up. Whatever you're going through, just like David here, he brings it to God in a prayer. How long will you forget me? God, will you now remember me, see me, and walk with me through this? The final thing that we see David do here is he chooses trust. <coughs> in verse 5, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. <clears throat> I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. This is the place of transition where David, even though he is still living with the storm, even though he is still living with the hardship, even though he is still fearing for his life, <coughs> he uses this word, but. But I choose to trust you, Lord, even though I'm still living here, even though I'm still ha handling these days of despair, I choose to trust in your unfailing love. Oh, this word, but I love the examples in scripture where there is someone going through a hardship, but God, but God did this, but God rescued, but God helped. Amazing examples in scripture of God who refuses to let us walk through a hardship without him there. This, this is the transition that takes place. And he has this song of the Lord's praise in his mouth. My heart rejoices in your salvation. Yes, it's darkness all around, but my heart is rejoicing. Yes, there is difficulty, immense difficulty in my life, but I will sing the Lord's praise. Why, David? Because you, God, you, Lord, have been good to me. Oh, we need to remember the Lord's goodness in our lives, to take the time to think of how the Lord has been good to me. If we don't take the time to write those things down, to remember them, if we don't take the time to acknowledge God's goodness, when we go through times of despair, it's easy to forget. All we can think about is the hardship. But David had these things in his mind, his stories of God's help, God's redemption, God's salvation, times where God answered his prayer that he's able to remember and therefore able to sing a song of the Lord's praise because God had been good to him. When you see these words, you know that someone is making a decision. They've come to a point where they say, I am deciding to trust in the Lord, this, making this decision. When I was a child, I used to do dot-to-dot -dot pictures, and I remember one that had hundreds of dots all over the place. It was confusing to find number one and then number two. It's really simple for the Christian. There's just one dot to connect that paints the picture, and that dot is God, a God who has been with us, who's helped us in the past. And when we examine his record in our lives, when we look at his faithfulness to you and to me, we too come to the place where we say, I'll sing the Lord's praise because the Lord has been good to me. One New Year's Day, years and years ago, in the Rose Bowl Parade, the Tournament of Roses Parade, a beautiful float was going down and it suddenly sputtered and then just quit. It was out of gas. The whole parade was held up for hours until someone could run to the gas station with a can of gas and fill it and put it back into the float to get it going. Who was the sponsor of this float? Well, it was the Standard Oil Company representing this float that ran out of gas, one of the largest gasoline producers in the world at that time. They couldn't have enough gas to run their own float. And often that's the picture of us having access to all of God's comfort having access to all of God's power that works in us through Christ, having access to all of God's presence, 
and yet not relying on it. You see, he has told us throughout the pages of Scripture that, that he delights to help. He is a God who helps, and he calls upon us to depend upon him. We acknowledge the pain. We bring a bold request to, to the Lord, and we choose to trust. God has given to us a book in the Scriptures that's designed to bring comfort some, page, some books in the Gospels and, or the New Testament and Old Testament are written to speak to our minds analytically. Some books are physical books that speak to the actions of Jesus, like the, the Gospel of Mark, and, and they speak of the, the fast-paced mission of Jesus. But some books are written for our spirits, like the book of Revelation is a spiritual book. It's written... Our minds have difficulty understanding it, but our spirits understand what it's saying. But some books are written for our emotions. The Gospel of John is a very emotional book. You look at the book of Psalms. Psalms written to speak to our emotions, to soothe our heart. I encourage you, all of us, to turn to the Psalms regularly. To open up the Psalms, today's date is the 30th, so start at Psalm 30, and then read, Psalm, add 30 to that in Psalm 60, and then add 30, 30 to that, Psalm 90, 30 to that in Psalm 20, or 120, and 30 to that in Psalms 150. If it's the first, then start at Psalm 1, and then add 30, 30 to that in Psalm 31. That gets the whole book of Psalms in a month. On the 31st, read Psalm 119, the, the longest chapter in the Psalms. But as you read, when you come across verses that are encouraging to you, comforting to you, then highlight those verses. Like in Psalm 34, when it says that a, a righteous person will have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Highlight that verse because it reminds us that, yes, a righteous person doesn't live a life without troubles, but you have the Lord who delivers or that place in Psalm 34 that says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he, his eyes, he's near to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Or, or the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their call. Or you go to Psalm 23 that, that says and highlight the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, I shall not be in need. Or Psalm 100 that says, says shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord in gladness. Or Psalm 95 that says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Oh, that we would take the time to read the Psalms daily as a, as a daily devotional. I'm thankful for people who have printed devotional guides. But I remind us that God has given to us his own devotional guide. Taking the Psalms. Or Psalm 119 a psalm that's written specifically for the purpose of teaching us the fear of the Lord. Nine different times it talks about the Word of God using various synonyms that are, that are like God's Word, His decrees, His statutes, His ordinances, His Word, His law, His commands. Uh, they have different meanings, but they're all aspects of God's Word. And Psalms 119 is written to bring soothing to soothe our emotions and our heart as we read it i encourage people to to not just read the psalms but to take time to memorize them i'm thankful to the person that encouraged me when i was 20 maybe 21 to memorize psalm 119 and i this psalm has become to me through the years like the north star of my life the compass that I go back to and I quote and recite portions of every single day because it means that much to me. Blessed are, blessed is, are they who, whose ways are blameless, who walk in the counsel of the Lord. How can a young man keep his way pure by living, building it according to your word? You are good and what you do is good. Seek me. I seek you with all my heart. These psalms that are written that are so powerful that, that we can quote back to God. And meditation is really taking those things that we've memorized and then quoting them back to God. Psalm 119 is written 
for that very purpose. You just take one verse a day and put it in your heart, your spirit, your mind, and quote it as you go to sleep at night. Cyprian of Carthage, uh, Cyprian of Carthage wrote to his friend Donatus in the third century. He said, it's a bad world, Donatus, an incredibly bad world, but I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and a holy people who have learned a great secret. They have found joy. They are despised and persecuted, but they care not. They have overcome the world. These people, Donatus, are Christians, and I am one of them. This is the peace that David experienced when he was going through this challenge. This is the peace that's available to every single one of us. No, God doesn't waste our pain and his suffering, but he invites us to acknowledge it, to come before him boldly with a bold request, and to choose trust and a song of praise in the midst of whatever we're going through. Try saying it, I'm trusting in God. Wake up tomorrow morning, whatever you're living with, and you say, I'm trusting in God. I invite you to do that. I invite you to believe in Jesus also, to confess that you believe that he's the son of God, to repent of your sins, and to make the decision to be immersed, baptized, raised to walk a new life. If we can help you make that decision or answer questions, please reach out to us. Let's close with a prayer. Father, we're thankful for the words that you give to us, your devotional guide and psalms written to soothe our hearts, to guide us to greater faith, to trust in you. We especially thank you, Father, that whatever we go through, that you use it to strengthen us, to cause us to have a greater faith in you, to minister to others who need to be comforted because we've been comforted by you. Help us to depend upon you in any storm of life. We do trust in you, Father. And it's in Jesus' precious name that I pray. Amen.
Still high.